really provides an alternative lens for looking at architecture and the histories we tell about architecture. So before I get into building a time, however, I want to start with a personal anecdote regarding my relationship with Marvin Trachtenberg and this book, um, as I think this in many ways kind of encapsulates why the theory is so remarkable and the impact it has had on my thinking and so many other my colleagues' thinkings about architecture. So I was first introduced to Trachtenberg as a building in time as a master's student. was soon to be published. Um, and the day after his presentation, he remained to lead an informal seminar with some graduate students. And the real purpose of the seminar was to speak generally and kind of um, in a very open manner about architectural history, to get to know Marvin Trachtenberg better, and to kind of better understand his thinking. And at one point, he asked all the students to go around and to introduce their research, whether that be a master's thesis or a PhD dissertation. Um, and at the time, I was in the midst of formulating my master's thesis on the Villa dei Vescovi, a residence that's located outside of Padova in Italy um, and was originally built for the very important humanist and amateur architect, among many other kind of titles he took, Elvise Cornaro. Um, so, Cornaro was also the Bishop of Padua, hence the villa's name, Villa dei Vescovi, or Villa of the Bishop. And at this point in the project, when I spoke to Marvin Trachtenberg, I was a bit distressed. I had already spent um, several months in Padua collecting archival material on the structure. And I had read basically everything that was published on the villa, on Cornaro, and on his architect, uh, Giovanni Maria Falconetto. And the predominant theme in the literature, almost all of which was in Italian, was the question of the villa's attribution. Was it the design of Conoro, the amateur architect, or Falconetto, the painter architect? And the problem was is that the villa was not completed under either figure, but took form over a 100 year period initially with an open air atrium in the center of this three-story structure, um, which was then later covered and enclosed. So for me, the uncertainty regarding the villa's original design and the architect was crucial. And I felt somewhat stuck in the whole research project because I couldn't find or I couldn't formulate a definitive answer. So I presented this all to Marvin Trachtenberg thinking and hoping that he might have some ingenious insights for me. But to my surprise, he simply responded, so what? Why do you care? Of course, I was initially taken a bit aback. I'm a relatively young student. But after some reflection, I realized that I actually had no great answer. In answer to his question, I couldn't think of why the authorship of the villa really mattered or why I had spent so much time agonizing over the original plan of the villa. I couldn't think of any great revelations that I hoped to unearth in naming a definitive author for this project. And as a result of kind of my obsession over this one fact, which maybe doesn't even have an answer, I had possibly neglected other aspects of the villa that were equally, if not more, intriguing. According to Marvin Trachtenberg's theory, in his thinking, a structure like the Villa dei Vescovi is best understood as an example of building in time. So what is this theory? Marvin Trachtenberg's concept of building in time in the book itself, which is a rather monumental 400-page study, um, centers on the figure of Leon Battista Alberti. And I think we all know Alberti, at least by name. Um, within the general narratives of architectural history and theory, he's best known for a select number of buildings, and more importantly, for his treatise on architects, De Re Arificatoria, which is considered um, the first modern architectural treatise. 
And specifically, his treatise is considered the first prescriptive tract that consciously attempts to elevate the status of the architect and of architecture as an intellectual discipline. Um, and he makes, as we all know, kind of this very clear um, distinction between the architect as intellectual and the craftsman as kind of a manual artisan figure. Trachtenberg would mostly agree with this general kind of conception or synopsis of Alberti, but he presents the writer in even more nuanced terms. Trachtenberg sees Alberti first and foremost as a writer a learned figure with a literary, not an artistic background. And he understands Alberti's conception of the architect as an extension of contemporary literary developments. And in particular, he underscores Alberti's reliance on Dante and Petrarch and their valorization of the author figure. So this merits a bit of explanation. According to 15th century literary culture and theory, most texts had a single author. And the title of author, or Latin for, was granted to an individual as virtue of his having produced a complete, worthy, and enduring text. Not every writer was an author, and certainly not every text was worth or worthy of being of worthy of authorship. Um, and I think, to a certain degree, we can kind of extend this conception to the contemporary period. A text message or a one-line email is not something you would want to complain, um, you would want to claim authorship of. But certainly a master's thesis or a published book or an article is the type of text to be associated with an individual author. In medieval author theory, only ancient or long dead writers were included amongst the ranks of the celebrated, almost immortal authors. But the shift comes in the 14th century with Dante and Petrarch, um, where now living or recently deceased writers could be considered as authors. And Dante himself was regarded as an author almost immediately following his death. And so this kind of expanded concept of the author is reflected in contemporary art of the period in the genre of the cycles of illustrious men. Um, and these were portrait series um, which depicted notable individuals um, and critically authors, individuals who had left a legacy in writing, um, who were considered foundational to classical intellectual thought, rhetoric, philosophy, um, and these portrait cycles were often displayed in public halls or in libraries as kind of a means of reflection, a model, um, exemplars to be followed. And so here I show you um, some, I think, of there are a total of 44 portraits of illustrious men in the Palace of Urbino in the Studiolo, um, which were in fact completed by um, Eustoph Stangent, a very important um, artist of the period. And we can see here that alongside figures like Hippocrates, Doctor, or Homer, obviously um, belonging to the field of uh, literary culture, we see the inclusion of Petrarch and Dante, kind of representative of this new um, expanded conception of an author being someone who can almost live in the present day. And what Alberti does is to frame the architect in terms of this new concept of the literary author, directly building upon the presidents of Dante and Petrarch. And in this formulation, he not only significantly elevates the status of the architect, he also redefines how the architect works and how buildings are produced. If the architect is a true author, the sole creator and worthy creator of an enduring composition, then the work, the building, must be like a text and must be similarly enduring and viable. 
the construction of a building is thus akin to publication. It cannot be changed once it's published. It is enduring, and like the text of a great author, it remains immortal. And through this process of creation, the authority, the autoritas, granted to the architect has a reciprocal effect. So the author architect acquires influence and fame through the renown of his perfect building. Well, at the same time, the authority and fame of the building, or his own authority and fame, elevates the status of the building. So it's kind of this back and forth. He elevates the status of the building. In turn, the building, which lasts for um, centuries, kind of elevates his fame through posterity. So while Alberti is clearly very important and really a pioneer in laying out this vision of the architect, Trachtenberg is also very clear that he was not living in a vacuum. Um, it's very clear from Trachtenberg as well as other writers, um, scholars, that Alberti is heavily reliant on existing classical texts, um, including more recent texts such as those of Petrarch, and Trachtenberg further emphasizes the degree to which Alberti was reliant on the model of Filippo Brunelleschi. This, in a sense, is not a new revelation. Um, it's well known that Alberti dedicated vernacular, the Italian version of his treatise on painting to Brunelleschi. Um, and scholars for decades have kind of paired the two as pioneers of the early Renaissance. But Trachtenberg takes the narrative one step further, presenting Brunelleschi as the motivating force, the real life inspiration behind Alberti's author architect. And this is due to Brunelleschi's remarkable feat in completing the cupola, the dome, of the Cathedral of Florence, this titanic project that was completed in a relatively quick period, about 30 years time or even less. Um, but what is truly revolutionary about this project, Trachtenberg argues, is not the technical innovation it um, displays and that, that made it possible, but was the way that Brunelleschi entered into the project already decades underway and was able to take complete control of it in a way that he became to be seen as the sole author of the cathedral, even though its construction preceded him and a good amount of work remained to be done after him. And in the book, Trachtenberg goes into a great deal of detail about Brunelleschi's professional and political career and how in this reciprocal pattern he used the ongoing project of the cupola to elevate his own status and the ever increasing celebrity and kind of notoriety of the dome, his own notoriety brought more attention to the dome. So again, it's kind of back and forth between um, the author, architect, and his singular piece of work um, feeding on one another and kind of elevating the status of one another as um, the project goes on. And this is all to say that Alberti's project, his vision for the architect was not his own. This is according to, again, Marvin Trachtenberg, but was deeply colored by contemporary thought and really the remarkable persona of Filippo Brunelleschi. In examining Alberti's theory on the author architect, Trachtenberg refers several times to a key passage of his treatise, and I will here quote it for you. Um, the brevity of human life and the scale of work ensure that scarcely any large building is even completed by whomever begins it. While we presumptuous followers strive by all means to make some alteration, to take pride in it as a result, Something begun well by an other is corrupted and finished badly. I feel that the intentions of authors, the product of mature reflection, must be upheld. 
Those who began the work might have had some motives that escape you, even if you examine it long and thoroughly and consider it fairly. And this is a very telling and a very important passage. Not only does it hold Alberti's conception of the architect as an author whose intentions must be upheld, even if hundreds of years later, another architect wants to change them, but it also indicates that this practice was not the norm. Alberti's clear, we kind of have this tendency to want to alter a building, but we can't do this. And as Alberti himself says, the brevity of human life in this period in which he wrote the 15th century and the relatively slow process of building, this is again before electricity, before power tools, before mass warehouses of materials, um, meant that few architects actually did see the completion of their building. And yet if we look at great structures of the period, like the Cathedral of Florence, they appear remarkably homogeneous. They appear as if they were designed by a single architect. And without the aid of archival evidence or scientific dating techniques, it would probably be very difficult for the plain eye to distinguish the different contributions and the different stages, really now over 700, 800 years that this building took shape. And likewise, a cathedral like Lincoln Cathedral, uh, like Lincoln Cathedral, the facade of which was completed over the course of 300 years, um, we would again kind of have trouble deciphering which was completed first and which was completed last. It seems remarkably um, coherent and complete. And Trachtenberg explains this ability of pre-modern architects to build in this manner as the product of their practice of building in time. In the most basic terms, building in time was a way of designing and building that was fundamentally based on collaboration over a transgenerational period. Building of time as described by Trachtenberg, was an uncodified theory of architectural design. This was not something that architects talked about or planned. Um, it was a system that was kind of deeply ingrained in their practice, and they fundamentally understood it and followed it. It was based on a group mentality, and the notion that building design and construction was a fluid, ongoing process. And within this, architects worked as a collective, even if they were divided by 10, 15, 20, 100 years. Trachtenberg understands the identity of the pre-modern architect as one who, who, that was essentially tied to the building on which he worked. Um, and this was even more so the case because there were no guilds of architects. There was no other social kind of identity that architects could affiliate with. Um, there was no clear conception of the architect's profession. Therefore, where a doctor or a lawyer remained a doctor or a lawyer, even when they weren't practicing as such, the ar architect was only an architect when he was involved in the building project. And while I don't quite personally agree with Marvin Trachtenberg on this point, I think there's actually good evidence that architects did retain an identity and were actively seeking to establish kind of a codified discipline in this period. Um, I think his assessment of this fundamentally collaborative building culture is correct. In the pre-modern period, it was rare that an architect would consciously work to corrupt or deform the project of another or the project that he'd inherited from his grandfather, his grand great-grandfather. Um, the architect really saw himself as a participant, a hand in a much longer ongoing process, a process that was never ideal or absolute, 
um, and that was fundamentally site bound and site specific. And I think that's very important. Um, within the system of building in time, redesign was normative. From the time the first foundation stone of a great structure was laid, it became involved or became engaged in a site-specific, place-specific evolution. And every phase of design was in a sense a phase of redesign. And I think this is really nicely illustrated by the case of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, um, which is a work site that obviously um, evolved over an extended period um, based on the foundations of the original church and then Bermonte's initial proposal, which was then inherited by subsequent architects, Giuliano de Sangallo, Raphael, Antonio de Sangallo the Younger, Michelangelo, and so on. Um, but what we see even by looking at the plans um, is that although each architect made some notable adjustments, the adjustments were in a way that was complementary. No architect and completely erased what the other had done. There was no saying, we're going to start anew. We're going to throw out Bermonti's plan. We're going to throw out Giuliano's plan. There were kind of these incremental changes that were made. Um, and in fact, we see that by the time Michelangelo inherits the project, there's still the possibility of kind of reverting back to Bermonti's plan to a certain degree. So there's this kind of continual linking of the stages of the project. It's evolving. It's almost organic. It's not any individual's kind of um, brainchild. And so in the same manner, building in time thus describes a very elastic, a very pragmatic system of architectural production. A system, again, which was not laid out in a rule book or explained to young student designers, but evolved from a social, technical, and political context of the period. This was the process of building in time. And again, this was considered a very good thing, a kind of, this was not something that was pushed back again or questioned. Um, it almost served as an anchor in a period where lifespans were short, mortality rates were high, um, and much about the life and future was uncertain. And this, I think, is nicely illustrated um, if you look up in kind of the center, in the um, background of this painting of Lorenzetti, the allegory of good government, Within the flourishing city, among the, the prosperous merchants and the, the people dancing in the street and happily going about their business, we see workers working on construction. This is part of kind of the urban fabric. This is part of what makes a city healthy and happy. Building is continuous. It's kind of a grounding force in everyday society. It's a grounding force of economy. It's something that is ever present. And in order to kind of describe how this process worked, this idea of building in time, Trachtenberg defines four key principles. And I think these are worth reviewing. They're a bit kind of theoretical and thorny, um, not necessarily because I think any one of you should adopt them in practice and start writing about them or rewriting treatises, um, but because they really constitute the heart of Trachtenberg's theory um, and give you a sense of how, as a historian and um, theoretical thinker, he approaches history. Um, and if you haven't heard of these terms, it's also not surprising because he basically made them up himself. So the four principles he describes are continuous redesign, myoptic progression, concatenation, and retrosynthesis. So the first principle, continuous redesign, was a fundamental condition of all architects, by which no design or structure was ever definitive or complete. And as I noted before, this is all from the idea of construction as a continuous ongoing process. Every design is a redesign. 
um, but also implied a rather egalitarian approach to design in the hierarchy of design. The openness of continuous redesign meant that the contribution of a previous architect could not be privileged over that of a later architect. The individuals who contributed over kind of the long durée of a building project were all more or less equal. Um, and they were given equal authority and their designs were given equal value. The second principle he describes is myoptic progression. And this refers to a gradual design method in which responsive solutions were made as the building took shape and as expectations for the structure evolved. So in history, myoptic progression was driven by a logic and the limitations of construction and making. Before the development of structural physics, buildings involved a good deal of experimentation, especially if you were going to deviate from a previous model. Certainty about the strength and the feasibility of a structure um, was not necessarily a theoretical task, not something that could be worked out on paper, but had to be worked out by actual building um, and by slowly making continuous changes and adjustments. And there are, you know, throughout the history of architecture, we see numerous examples of this where um, in a cathedral, extra buttresses are added or um, the piers inside of a great, um, you know, domed space are reinforced. The third principle Trachtenberg defines is concatenation, literally this chain-like process of building. Um, and the practice and really total acceptance of concatenation allowed the structure to retain a cohesive quality despite the passage of time because each step of the building process was linked to a previous unit. Nothing was kind of entirely knew, but there was this, again, almost organic evolution of the building based on what was already realized. Um, and a prime example of this is the Cathedral of Amiens, um, the plan of which, as seen in this diagram, evolves from a standard unit, which was then extended and repeated various forms, giving the entire cathedral a great um, cohesive quality, um, despite the fact that it was designed probably by multiple designers over the course of 50 years, which is still a relatively actually incredibly fast process for this time period. And the formal though evolution of Amiens um, was controlled by the final principle of retrosynthesis. Um, and according to Marvin Trachtenberg, retrosynthesis through retrosynthesis, the long history of a building became the history of a series of coherent projects. Each project is integral into itself, but at the same time conceived according to an integral whole. This is to say no designer comes you know, to the table and decides to entirely revolutionize what has been done or to deviate dramatically from what has come before but really makes an insertion that fits within kind of a greater chain of the building development. So where concatenation describes each building phase linking onto the next, retrosynthesis looks forward to a degree assuring that each phase is conceived in accordance with the plan for a coherent whole. And the nearly 300 year development of uh, the Piazza del Miracoli in Pisa is somewhat indicative of this. Um, the Duomo, and there's a detail on the top left, um, was completed over an extended period. And due to the settling of marshy foundations, changes had to be made to the structure as building progressed. And this is obviously also very famous in the Leaning Tower of Pisa, where the structure was already kind of um, starting to tip well, construction was still underway and changes had to be made during the construction process. But as we see with the Duomo on the exterior nave, again in this image on the upper left, 
um, the cornice is in fact completed at an angle and the columns are appropriately shortened um, as kind of to make this link between the nave, which is now at a lower elevation than the new facade. So this kind of a fudging of the details, but in a way to make the building still appear coherent and complete. At this point, you might all be thinking, well, this seems like a very intriguing theory, but real, what really is the greater point? Um, and further, why should an architect working in the 21st century really be concerned with this idea of building in time? Margaret Trachtenberg's theory of building in time is not just an explanation of how pre-modern architecture was realized. More critically, is it a revisionist view of medieval and Renaissance architecture, which we might call early modern architecture, the core argument being that building processes in this period were not illogical or haphazard as often as thought, but were actually based on a highly sensitive, highly sophisticated set of principles. And the highly pragmatic evolutionary design methods that were employed in the realization of structures like the Lincoln Cathedral or the Duomo of Pisa were the same as those that continued up until the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, where kind of mechanization really changed the way architecture was realized. The concept and theory of building a time is also very I think, constructive for the alternatives it presents to author-dominated historical narratives. Um, and this has been particularly informative in my own research. Um, within the scope of early modern art and architecture, there is so much attention and value given to questions of attribution, um, with the implicit suggestion that if we could identify the designer of a structure we would automatically better understand it and be able to better value it. Um, but as Trachtenberg underscores, this is really not necessarily the case. And this is not least because architecture is a fundamentally collaborative endeavor. Um, and great buildings in their design and realization involve many hands, many participants. Um, so by insisting that historians forego this obsession, this kind of trying to find an original design or an original author, and instead embrace a more temporally inclusive reading of architecture, the theory really liberates us from the traps of attribution and author-based history. And this was so much felt by me as a master's student when I was just weighed down by these questions of Ville de Vescovi he said, why do you care? Look beyond it. And it kind of opened my eyes to this whole other scope of history and this whole other narrative of the villa that I could then explore. Um, and in moving away from questions of attribution, it also really allows us to look at, at questions of building processes, of building context. It kind of enriches and nuances the whole narratives that we tell about um, history, how a building is made, how it is used, how it is adapted over time. There's no one answer for a given building, but there's kind of a series, an ongoing narrative that unfolds. Um, a building is in some sense kind of still alive and still kind of presenting new histories with every kind of day that passes. And there are so many examples of this in history, but just to kind of, again, touch on a few, um, we can think of the Santa Maria della Misericordia in Arezzo, um, a structure, the lower part of which was realized in around 1375, the upper part realized 60 years later, according to Bernard Vino Rosalino, and then the bell tower kind of realized with the clock at an even later date, um, more evocative of um, kind of the scientific principles of the mid 16th century. So again, a building that is not kind of a single um, 
it is a cohesive whole, but its history cannot be kind of told in a single line or there's not a single narrative here, but really the building kind of unfolds as um, something that was produced in time and really evolved with this changing social and cultural status of period, um, but was still kind of obviously very much bound to its specific site in the central piazza of Arezzo. Another um, fabulous example would be the Plaza um, San Savino in Naples, which was first designed as a palace and then turned into a church. Um, and yet another wonderful example is the Cathedral of Syracuse, Sicily, um, first a Greek temple, later kind of converted into a Byzantine church, and finally went um, underwent some redesign with this amazing Baroque facade that was added in the 18th century, with, of course, many intermediary stages of building in between all this. And just to note, for, I think, another kind of hot topic of the moment is this idea of resilience in architecture, which kind of, I think, stands hand in hand with sustainability. Um, and Trachtenberg's theory is really quite instructive in thinking about how a building um, and a place is resilient and how kind of it adapts over time to the needs of a population. But beyond its value in the study of architectural history, Trachtenberg's theory and more generally, I think, our knowledge of pre-modern systems and logic of building is very instructive for our own contemporary building culture. Within the book, uh, Marvin Trachtenberg draws a very direct relationship between Alberti's theory and contemporary architectural thought, and specifically this fear, this phobia of time. And I think for many students of architecture, as also students of medicine, law, business, everything and everyone in the past is dusty, old, worn down, we should forget it. Um, and within the modernist mindset, and I'm obviously speaking very generally here, um, the past is the past and the aim is to move forward, to innovate, to start on a fresh clean slate, to make something new, to be unprecedented. And implicitly in this, there is this fear of time, fear of the effects of time. Um, and this, this fear, we'd almost say a fear of death or fear of being forgotten, really extends back to classical antiquity. It itself is not anything new or modern. Um, Marvin Trachtenberg quotes a famous passage of Ovid, which says, time destroys all things, and demonstrates that this idea was deeply internalized in Alberti and embedded in his conception of the architect. This idea of trying not to be forgotten. How can the architect be immortal? And this same sense of fear, this fear of um, being forgotten, this fear of time, in many ways defines the modern movement. Um, and of course, there are notable exceptions to this. Um, and there are examples of anonymity in the modern period from the Die Stiel to the Metabolists. But the dominant model, I think, remains much the same. The architectural construct is an autonomous individual project a structure which once completed can be held like a work of art. And we've certainly seen this with the development of the new um, kind of museum architecture, which um, the structures themselves are the greatest art object of those particular collections. And this is, of course, also very evocatively um, presented in the work of Norman Foster, Daha Adid, um, Kulaus Nolme. And Trachtenberg goes so far as to relate what he calls chronophobia, the fear of time, with the process of chronocide in modern architecture, literally the death of time. Um, and this is directly related to the contemporary concept of the architect. In the most general terms, the architect today is granted authority based on her idea, her design concept, 
which is dominant over the material reality of the building. But in different terms, architects work today under the premise that the future completed building must conform to the present design. There's no evolution, there's no modification, time is eliminated. You deliver the blueprints, the blueprints are realized. And on this point, Marvin Trachtenberg cites a really intriguing conversation between the British philosopher Richard Wolheim with the eminent modern architect Richard Meyer. And the two are having lunch, and over the course of the conversation, Wolheim suggests that the best kinds of buildings are those that allow for improvisation and adaptation. And Meyer vehemently rejects this idea, and he responds, improvisation, I wish I never hear that word again. When you build a building, you determine the parameters, you work out the values, you get them right. And then when things change, you pull the building down and you start again. And I think this response is a bit startling, especially for someone like Meyer, who kind of is deeply influenced by classical precedents. And in some ways, perhaps as quoted by Marvin Trachtenberg, it's a bit extreme, but it does reflect to a degree the modernist agenda. Um, and there's a really compelling paradox here, and this is where I'm going to close. Um, whereas in the age of building and time, architecture was very present focused and by necessity so, architects couldn't really envision a structure 100 years out when they could barely plan if they were going to be alive necessarily in you know, two years time. In the modern age, with advanced technology, with this demand for high seat speed construction, and this idealized sense of the future, architects seek to look ahead. They want to see the future for us. They want to see what the building can do. They want to see how it can make social changes. They want to anticipate future needs and future behaviors. And when the building fails to do this, and it so often does, when the needs change, the building is simply destroyed. As when Meyer said, when things change, you simply pull it down and start again. Um, so this is where I will conclude, really just with kind of hoping that this is provided some food for thought in thinking about kind of our current processes of design and construction and maybe how we can learn from the past or at least um, take some models um, from the way buildings were done in previous centuries. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, Elizabeth Merrill, for the very interesting uh, lecture. It was very well structur structurized and very clear. Um, also, really interesting view of uh, the concept of duration. Um, it also is an interesting point of view um, in the concept of our Jokerweek, um, Duré, um, the philosopher Pierre Ké. Um, so I propose that if people have questions, they come to the radio studio and they can ask it directly to you through the mic. Um, so welcome, students. Hi, uh, Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. All right. Uh, hi. Thank you for uh, for your lecture. Um, I've got uh, well. I, I've got one question. Um, so you 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 talked obviously about the 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 long construction processes and uh, and about uh, the notion of of resility and and, and durability in a way. Um, so since I think this could be a, a, a possible um a possible strategy in construction in contemporary construction to to become more sustainable 
uh, as, as, as architecture, uh, making durable buildings. Um, I wonder to which extent you, you think this way of, of, of adopting long construction processes, to which extent this could be um, redone uh, in the contemporary building scene? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, I'm not myself a practicing architect, so, um, but I have a strong sense that if you were to say to a patron that you were going to deliver his or her building in 200 years, they would not respond very favorably to the proposal. Um, I think what is, however, though, maybe striking about the theory for modern thought is just maybe this, again, this paradox that I drew at the end between kind of living in the moment, almost building for the moment and building with something that almost is inherently, you're kind of focused on the good design, you're focused on um, what in a sense you know works as opposed to trying to forecast the future and be revolutionary. And I think that's where things maybe um, perhaps it's where the greatest advancements are made, but also where the greatest failures also emerge. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know it's it was uh, from the beginning uh, sort of an unrealistic thought of mine, but uh, I was just, you know, wondering what you thought about it. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, also I think what it says about the role of the architect and kind of the need to maybe temper the ego um, that architects have kind of adopted this Albertian notion, which for much of history was simply impossible, um, but that now Al architects do want to be immortal. They do want to leave their work of art. Um, and maybe how that kind of ego gets in the way of really constructive building processes. Okay, okay thank you. Um, uh, there is another question coming through the mixed cloud, so I'll pass the mic to Sander again. All right, um, Eve Books. Eve Books asks, how can we anticipate you think you think against this notion of authorship within our education? How can we anticipate new things? No, no, no. So, sorry, I uh, read it not well. Um, <laughs> How can we anticipate against this notion of authorship within our education, you think? How can we maybe temper the notion of authorship? Um, anticipate against the notion of authorship. Mm -hmm. Is <laughs> Good question. I mean, I think you know, we'd like to point to the great, you know, Stark text type figures, um, but really they are the anomaly still. So it's, and the types of structures that they build are obviously quite the exception to what most, most architects do. Um, so yeah, it's a different, difficult question. I mean, I think there is probably two parallel um, if not more kind of strands of architectural thought, and I'm, I'm quite convinced that many architects don't really see themselves as great creative authors, really see themselves contributing to a larger ongoing project. Um, but perhaps this dominant paradigm of the authorial figure and maybe even kind of our innate desire to design and to see something constructed manifest in a way with that kind of collaborative I that's my best answer. I think. Um, I think in the being a historian and looking at the history of architecture, it's very constructive. That the question of attribution and much more critical of all the hands that were involved, and to really think about what the architect did, what his contribution was. Um, as well as that of all the other individuals project. I think I'm very personally interested in looking at. All right. Um, was that clear, Eve? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a bit uh, 
a bit, uh, hoe zeg je vertraging? Uh, a bit of a delay on the live stream. So if it's probably now hearing you, you give the answer. Okay. So um, one last last call. Are there any other questions? Hello. Thank you for uh, the lecture. It was very Thank interesting. Um, and I, I quite agree with uh, the topic you mentioned about time and duration. Um, I just was just uh, something I would like to share. Like, did you read the, the book of the craftsman, uh, Richard Sene, where he is talking about how makers or people who build things, uh, and I think the architect is also part of that group, um, are under pressure of becoming an artist, uh, and that's a consequence of the, um, the way we live, uh, the current value system, uh, generally speaking, capitalism. Um, and so, yeah, what I'm actually feeling a lot is just, um, or there is not really like a one answer, but like we need another value system of another way of life. Um, that's. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Very just, but uh, yeah, I yeah, just that, wanted to. That would uh, be very easy to accomplish. <laughs> um, yes, um, no, but because everything is done within a current value system uh, that it's also quite economically based and capitalism and blah 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 blah. So um, for yeah, the thing how things evolves, it's not a surprise uh, how art uh, architects are becoming artists. How the shift is uh, on the person and the, on human um, and we who dream of eternal life and want to project that and the things we do um, and it's not about architecture anymore it's not about space anymore it's about me me and me like in the quote you showed about mayor it's mm -hmm. all the I, um, I counted how many times the word you was in the code, but it's all about us and not about space or architecture yeah. anymore. And it's just a consequence of how, how we do things and how we, um, yes, earn our values, whether it's material or immaterial value. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, and it's an, a nice point of perspective, like a confirmation of what is happening around us. And indeed, the notion of time is completely absent in the current, um, in our current value system. Everything is one moment, one, everything has to, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very fast moving and yeah. we don't have so, a lot of patience. Uh, I think I yeah. would counter though your thought with just maybe problematizing or playing devil's advocate is this kind of altruistic motives that can come out though and artificial programs can also be very ego driven yes. and i can think of projects where architects you know want to i mean it's quite obvious transform the way an entire society lives or an entire population of people and they think they're doing it for the best but really they're doing it as a means of control or kind of inserting their vision on another population yes um, there is no such thing as uh, trying to build a better world. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe in I don't believe in these things as well. So um, um, that's bullshit indeed. Um, yeah. <laughs> sorry that. for the language, but it is. No, no, no. It's, uh, no. It's, it's something that you kind of have to continue to deal with. I don't think it's necessarily going to go away. I think anything that we make has that inherent in it. So I think mm -hmm. maybe that's only tempered by the fact that if a building has so long of a duration and has so many hands involved that that kind of individual um, vision is somewhat kind of diminished. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, trying to make a better world is just a way of uh, making us comfortable sleep at night for our, our actions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm mm -hmm. gonna pause the mic. <laughs> Here you go. All right. Um, I guess uh, I guess that was it then. Um, so once again, thank you very much. Um, Hust, can you check again if there are no questions on the live stream? No, no questions anymore. So um, thank you. And um, three days of reading. <laughs> Okay, very good. Enjoy. Good luck. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.